Okay, so uh, let me say a few words of what we did and what we are going to do uh, today. So what we did last time is talk about two ways to think about consciousness in relation to attention. So that's what we talked about last time. And these two models are here on the blackboard. We talk about the gatekeeper model and the phenomenal field model. And the difference has to do with the relation between consciousness and attention. In the view that I called gatekeeper, which is probably the dominant view in cognitive science, attention is a gatekeeper of consciousness, meaning what is in consciousness is what we attend to. And so it is a gatekeeper of consciousness, and what is in consciousness is what has been processed by attention. So it all starts with this, for example, per perceptual processing. I gave the example of sight, uh, in which uh, it all starts uh, with the receptacle in the eyes, and then gradually the different signal from the different receptacle in the eyes get combined to form first shapes and colors separate when they are brought together to form objects. That's what I called perceptual processing. And so in this view, obviously perceptual processing is what, where it starts from, and then what we're talking about is consciousness. And in this view, what is in consciousness is what has been, what we are tending to, right? So this is a view which is going to privilege attention, which is going to privilege um, information processing and this is why it's probably uh, the dominant view in the field of cognitive science, because in cognitive science, a dominant view uh, nowadays is called computationalism, which is the idea that you can understand consciousness as a form of computation, as a form of information processing. So this is one view, and this is not the view I'm going to talk about in this course, but to understand where I'm going to, it's important to keep this in mind. This is why I assigned one of this uh, chapter in, the, in this piece by, uh, what's his name? Andy Clark. Andy Clark, yeah. And that gives you an idea of how people think about consciousness from a cognitivistic perspective in which consciousness is just a form of information processing. Okay? So, this is the general context which we talked about last time. The view that I'm going to explore today for phenomenology is a different view. It is a view which I call phenomenal field. That's my old term. But it is a view that argues that there is more in consciousness than what we can attend to. Okay? Yes? Since last week and today, you still haven't said what phenomenology is. I'm going to talk about it today. That's a topic of today. I'm just summarizing what we are talking, talked about last time. I will define. Don't worry. Don't worry. Yes, I will define. <laughs> hey, but you're right. Uh, if you have questions which you think are directly relevant to what I say, don't hesitate to raise your hand and uh, uh, interrupt me if it is directly relevant. Otherwise, if you want to know my opinion about reincarnation, that might wait another time. <laughs> okay, let's be serious. Uh, perceptual processing, so that's the same. So what is this view different? This view differ differs in that it holds that there is more in consciousness that one we can attend to. For example, 
uh, here is the question. How rich is our f perceptual field? OK. How rich is our perceptual field? Well, people dif differ on this question. My own opinion is that our perceptual field is actually quite rich. Though what is actually processed in detail by cognition at every moment is actually quite narrow. People talk about like this. I don't know exactly how broad it is. So this is an example, I think, where uh, I think there is a good argument to make that actually there is more in consciousness than what we can attend to directly. The other example that I gave... Can I do that one, a little Venn diagram? OK, OK. <laughs> the other uh, example is, that I gave is inattention, is kind of uh, inattentive cognition, in which, for example, you're talking to somebody and you see your friend uh, coming on the side, and then your attention is totally drawn to your friend, and uh, you kind of lose track of what the person is saying, but you still have his words into your awareness. And so I would say that's another example that I have given of a situation that suggests that it makes sense to try to think about consciousness as having an overflow in relation to attention. There is more to consciousness than what we can attend to, right? So we can draw it this way? This is what you're attending to? Yeah. But there may be other things in consciousness yes. too. Yes, exactly. So <laughs> in this way of thinking, okay, in the first way of thinking, the, in a way you can say there is a kind of one-off difference between the processing which is non-conscious and what is conscious and that's purely determined by attention. Whereas in my view, uh, and the view defended by phenomenologists, and I think by uh, many Buddhists as well, there is more in consciousness than we can attend to. Therefore, it's not an either, consciousness is not an either or, but there might be gradation of what we can be more or less conscious to within any moment uh, within any mental state, right? And that's a view that I'm going to defend here, okay? That's what we did last time. Okay, question, no question? Fine, yes? Quick question, you talked about attention and consciousness, yes. and something happening over there. Uh, I can imagine for a lot of women that would be kind of strange because women are the best at multitasking. That so, somehow their attention can be in many different spaces at the same time. So it's just an expansion of attention. Um, well, okay. That might, that might yeah. create the consciousness. Okay, uh, I simplified a little bit um, my own view. Now, let me say the evidence, and I think it's for both men and women uh, coming from psychology, is that we're extremely poor at multitasking. Now, so, okay. okay. <laughs> so, uh, but you're right. There is a question, the interesting question, that in this model here, uh, is it the case that there is just what is in attention and what's not in attention? Or is it a question of degree of attention, right? Because if you think of attention as a processing that the brain is doing towards the input coming from example from the senses, it makes sense to think about slightly differently in terms of what's in the foreground and what's in the background. So that's how you would refine it in saying it's not that this is completely outside of the, the realm of attention, but it's not in the foreground, right? Because there is 
a background, and that's precisely what this view of consciousness argues, which is that there is an overflow. It's not like kind of, we don't see uh, from conscious point of view, we don't see a kind of object separate one by one. We see them against the background, right? That's true for vision, but that's true for consciousness more broadly, right? All our cognition takes place against the background, which is made of many different elements, right? For example, uh, there might be, I might be like, doing something and then in the background there is a really annoying noise and then I get angry, but I really don't know why I'm angry. It's just, this is in my consciousness. And so what we're talking about is the structuring between background and foreground. So that's indeed what this view uh, would be committed to. Yes. Yeah. background and foreground model, is it related to the uh, fast thinking and slow thinking? Not necessarily, no. Uh, not necessarily. I apologize, I wasn't here last week. Are we using awareness and consciousness as the same? I haven't used the word awareness yet. Used awareness. No, I have not used the. I have used the word consciousness, and I'm going to talk about it today. Okay. Yep. Can I just make an observation and then ask a question? Okay. Sure. Observation is the gatekeeper model. You're saying that that's what most cognitive scientists tend to stick to. Yes. Seems very Cartesian. The mind is this essence that goes and cognizes an object and then you're conscious of it. Whereas the phenomenal fields, I suppose that's your contribution. Well, the term is mind, but this is what phenomenal... Is, is not yours, or is it? What? Is the phenomenal field model, is it your sort of... No, it's, it's my word for what phenomenologists and I think many uh, Buddhists, for example, I don't know, in Yogacara and uh, in kind of Nigma and Kagyu uh, tradition think about consciousness. So it's, right. yeah. So my, yeah. So my question then is that the phenomenal field view of consciousness, cognition, does seem very Buddhist. I mean, have phenomenologists got that from Buddhism? Or no. They've arrived at it independently. Totally independently. So this is Descartes versus the Buddha? No, it's not Descartes. It's Husserl's <laughs> and Merleau-Ponty versus the Buddha. Yes. They're well, the Buddha, I don't know. Maybe Asanga, Vasubandhu, and Dharmakirti. I mean, yeah. As, as far as I know, there is no connection whatsoever. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, you have people like William James, is one of the old uh, ancestor of this kind of way of thinking about consciousness, not this model, but about consciousness in general. And then you have a whole school which try to use introspection, and then you have phenomenology. And that's where I'm taking, and I will define phenomenology. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Was there another hand? I just, just wanted to just clarify. Yes, please. The distinction between object, between attention and consciousness. And so consciousness, it sounds like there could be different types of levels. But is it it's possible that for consciousness to exist and my, my body to be engaged with the world, but I might not be able to articulate what is actually happening? Oh, sure. That, that would be a case of Oh, absolutely. Yes. In fact, this model is going to play a very emph strong emphasis on what we could call the pre-reflective level of experience, and we'll come to that, but absolutely. Okay, uh, so now if we take this model, uh, how are we going to understand consciousness? Well, that's where I will claim that we can use phenomenology, and Buddhism kind of, they have more or less the same, some of the same insights to build a fairly, give us a relatively clear description of consciousness. Now, I emphasize the word description, okay? So, phenomenology is a description of consciousness. It's not an explanation. Okay, what's the difference? 
the difference is that an explanation, typically, it's done in terms of causes producing certain effects. So, for example, when you try to explain consciousness through brain science, you are doing explanation. Now, you would say, why don't you do this? Well, this is not what I do. And as I said last time, uh, brain science is very far away from being able to really give us a good account of consciousness, a good explanation of consciousness. So, what some people like myself and others are doing is try to think about consciousness in kind of two ways. One is what I would call it from the first person perspective, and the other is from the third person perspective. What's a first person perspective? Well, that's going to be the domain of phenomenology, which is going to be a description of experience. It's a description of my experience. Okay? <laughs> and that's what phenomenology is going to provide. A description of experience, or otherwise put, a description of what, what is given in experience. Okay? That's what I call the first-person perspective, right? <coughs> first-person perspective is concerned with description of experience. Okay? Third-person perspective is concerned with the description that we can obtain of various observable facts or mechanism <coughs> if we can get to that. So, for example, when we do psychological testing, that's a third-person perspective, right? It's not, we're not asking people, what is your experience? We set certain parameters and we make people do the, exper the, ex the experiment, and so we get some objective result, right? So, if you want to say third-person perspective is a kind of objective approach, in the sense that it's not the approach of anybody looking at his or her experience. Obviously, the word objective is loaded, but we don't need to go to that. Whereas, the first-person perspective is subjective. Now, it's being subjective doesn't mean anything goes. It's not like Trumpian philosophy. <laughs> subjective doesn't mean anything goes, but it means from the point of view of the subject, right, of experience. I have experience, and from my point of view, for example, I am this body standing, I am from the inside of this body, and I have this visual field around myself, right? That's a first-person perspective. So be careful, the first-person perspective is not what is inside, is not what is outside, it's the experience itself, which is both inside and outside. For example, in teaching I have a, a feeling of, uh, well, when I do well, of elation, that's obviously inside, that's part of my experience, but I have also this visual field, I am hearing, and so on. So, first-person perspective is a perspective that we can get each of us on our own experience. <laughs> the third-person perspective is not dealing with the inside of the outside, but is dealing with this experience, but from an objective point of view, right? what can be measured, reproduced, tested, and so on. So, this is cognitive science, builds a model of cognition, it's psychology, um, maybe in part it's neuroscience, all these are third-person perspective, right? So, what some people like to do nowadays, and I think that's a quite uh, fruitful approach, and that's what the book is doing, is using first and third person perspective kind of together and seeing where we get to. 
Now you could say, why do that? Well, we do that because really to, if we had the full explanation of consciousness, if there is such explanation, because this is, is itself an issue, some people argue that there is no explanation of consciousness, that consciousness is a given and cannot be explained. So if there is an explanation of consciousness, uh, you would say, well, why don't we look at neuroscience? Well, as I said last time, neuroscience is very far from being able to provide such explanation because, well, the brain is so complex and so difficult to get to, right? It's extremely difficult to get to the brain, and so we know very little. Right now, what neuroscience is really good at is kind of mapping the different parts of the brain. And that's basically where it is at. And they produce this wonderful, color, colorful picture, which are, I mean, very nice pictures. And they tell us certainly something, but they don't give an explanation of what consciousness is. So when you hear, when you read or hear a title like Scientists Explain Consciousness, well, think, realize that this is kind of journalism, uh, well, let's not be impolite, but a shortcut to say this person has something to say about consciousness, because in fact, well, we don't want to go a Trumpian way and trash the press, right? I mean, journalists do a useful job because they filter a lot of information for us, but it's also the case that often they know very little about what, they have to talk about a lot of things and often they don't know very much. And so when you hear like the God neuron, uh, the, this, uh, we are about to find what consciousness is and so on, you should understand that you should take it with a grain of salt because this is, let's call it a hyperbole, right? <laughs> okay, so here we, <laughs> is this a hand? No, no, it's not a hand. <laughs> that's fine, that's fine. Uh, so what we are interested in is thinking about how to relate first and third person perspective. And this is basically what this book is doing. This book is talking about phenomenology, meaning a description of experience, of what is given an experience, in relation to cognitive science, psychology, a little bit of neuroscience, and this is basically, uh, I think, one of the interesting and probably most fruitful way to talk about consciousness, especially from a Buddhist perspective. Okay. So, we are going to do today phenomenology. We are going to cover a lot of ground because we are going to talk about Husserl and we are going to talk about Merleau-Ponty. And hopefully uh, we will start to make sense of this term consciousness understood as being this kind of model. Okay, so first person perspective is uh, description of experience, right? Okay? Okay, let me ask you a question. How would you describe your experience? By example? The, the, examples or just we, we have experience now. Okay. Yeah. Because I want you to understand what it is that phenomenology is doing and why this is not such an obvious thing to do. Yes, sir? You can describe it as your feelings, okay. your opinion, your oh, thoughts, yeah. your body. What, what do you mean, your body? Your body comfort. Okay, body your, your, bo your bodily sensation. Body sensation. Yes, let's talk about experience, right? How would you describe your experience? Hopefully you're opening your eyes and you didn't even mention that you have visual experience, right? Yes? As a, a, a what? Stream, stream of events. Stream of events. Okay. And, okay. Uh, can you say more? Uh, so, maybe not. Okay, yes? 
I see you. Okay. Do you experience of a picture? I, the, the seeing part is the experience. The link between the eye and the... No, 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 no. I'm talking about your experience. Do you have an experience of picture? It's what you do with what you see. I'm talking about experience. Because what you're doing actually is talking about your experience, about what you think your experience is based on, to, which is often what we do, right? I think I could describe uh, relating to the senses. Okay. So feeling the cool little air conditioning. Uh, so this is bodily sensation. Exactly. Yes. And who is feeling all this I? Okay. <laughs> okay. So the okay. sense of, of there being a place where experience From, is processed. Okay. Um, that's what it seems That's like. not an experience. You're not experiencing processing. No, yeah, right. where experience is, yeah, that's right. But I think what you maybe mean is that we have, so let me put it from a Buddhist point of view. We have six types of experience, which five bodily senses in the mind. And they come in different types of quality. Okay. And I'd say the, the mental part of that is the stream of verbalization. That's part of your experience. But the, what is your experience right now? It's all of that. Okay. Well, it's a experience. What's that? It's a It's like the things that appear. Okay. Stage of that which knows. Okay. It, no, none of this is necessarily right or wrong. Uh, the point I want to make is, uh, in a way, twofold. But the first point is that description of experience is far from obvious. Okay? Because, in a way, we could go Virginia Woolf or Proust way, right? Describe every little detail of one's own experience. And that would be a, de a description of experience, right? It turns out it would not be very useful for what we are for doing cognitive science, right? So description of experience is complicated matter. And so what phenomenology is trying to do is provide features of experience, trying to look for features of experience that are of a general import. Because the particular feelings that you have in your body is not going to tell us a whole lot about consciousness as such. So what we are going to go for is for general features of experience, what I call putative candidates for invariant features of cognition. Putative candidates for invariant features. P U T A T A. A. Puta T I V E candidates for invariant features of experience rather than for invariant features or for invariants. A N T S for invariance of experience. OK? Let me explain. <laughs> OK. PCIE. I hate this abbreviation because I always forget what they are for. But anyway, so let me explain this, and then you may have a question. What we're looking for is general features of experience that exist across the board, right? Now, why do I say putative? Because we don't, we, when we generalize from one's own experience, we don't know how generalizable it is, right? What does putative mean? Uh, 
like something is putative when you uh, consider it. Possible. Possible. Potential. Potential. Accepted What's that? He's reading from Google. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, except not everybody would accept it. That's uh, the problem. So this is why I say putative. Okay, so what we're looking at is, is invariance. That is invariant features, features that are present, present in all forms of experience, right? Because why we want that? Because we want that because we want a description of consciousness that is as general as possible. Because the Virginia Woolf way is not going to help us to do cognitive science. What we need is this kind of very generalizable features and then we can start to think about how they uh, might be implemented from a third person perspective, right? So that's what we're going to do. Now let me say a, a few words about phenom a few more words about phenomenology. So phenomenology, please write, was started by Husserl, who was a started by Brentano. Who was a student of Brentano. So if you want to put Brentano, I am perfectly comfortable <laughs> with that. Absolutely. That's okay. <laughs> Yes, several others. So, <laughs> who's, we'll mostly talk about Husserl, but uh, it certainly starts with Brentano. Uh, and we'll talk about Brentano when we talk about uh, uh, intentionality. So, Husserl is probably thought to be the main person in the phenomenological tradition. His work can be divided in several stages. So today what I will deal with is what is called static phenomenology. And next time we'll talk about dynamic phenomenology, which is time consciousness of how consciousness unfolds in time, which is something really cool, which is really important to, for cognitive science nowadays. So today we are doing static phenomenology. Now, let me emphasize that what I'm doing and what this book is doing is quite different in a way than what Husserl was doing. Because Husserl was not just busy trying to provide a description of subjectivity, which is what this book and what I'm trying to do. He really wanted to provide a complete system which would be the foundation for all possible human knowledge. Because he thought all possible human knowledge is based on human experience, therefore we should be able to provide the foundation for all knowledge. And so what, how Husserl calls his phenomenology is transcendental, meaning it's looking for the condition of the possibility of experience. This is not what we are going to do here. And this is why it's really difficult to read Husserl, because Husserl's project is much broader and it's extremely complex. Uh, this is not what we're doing here. What we are doing here is not doing transcendental philosophy per se, but we're doing a little bit, some, a weaker version of that by looking at the putative candidates for invariance of experience, right? Meaning we are looking for very general features of experience and then hopefully this gives us a good sense of what, a good description of what consciousness is, explanation yet to come in the future. Pikai is common denominator. What's that? Pikai. Pikai. Is common denominator. Yeah, if you want. It's featured present in all, all or most experience. Putative because we don't want to go too fast, right? Do you still have a question? Yeah, it's not very relevant. Okay, so. Okay, so what are the features of experience that Husserl talks about? Well, there are several. 
The first one is intentionality. So this is. Do you Every see? mental phenomenon is characterized by what the scholastics of the Middle Ages call the intentional or mental, intentional or mental, in, in existence, in, ex, in existence of an object, and what we might call, though not wholly unambiguously, reference to a content, direction toward an object which is not to be understood here as meaning a thing. I can't really read the parentheses very well, so I'm trying to act <laughs> That's it. okay. Or Keep imminent going. objectivity. Every mental phenomenon includes something as object within itself, although they do not all do so in the same way. In presentation, in, in presentation something, to present it, something is presented in judgment, something is affirmed or denied, in love, loved, in hate, hated, in desire, desired, and so on. This intentional in existence is characteristic exclusively of mental phenomena. No physical phenomenon exhibits anything like it. We can therefore define mental phenomena by saying that they that they are those phenomena which contain an object intentionally within themselves. Okay, thank you. So, this is intentionality. This is the locus classicus of this notion of intentionality, which goes back to Brentano. And the word obviously is extreme, is in a way extremely misleading, but is appropriate. It's misleading because the word suggests that we are talking about intention, right? As I intend, volition, will, and so on. No, we're not talking about that. Intentionality comes from the word intention, and the intention of the term is the meaning of that term. So, intentionality is refers to meaning, not to human intention, not to volition, okay? So, often people think as... Can, Brent, can we give like an example? I am going to give example, okay? <laughs> so, reference to an object, okay, that's true, but that has to be understood properly, and it's actually tricky to use the word object. Here is the example. Uh, my vision of a pink elephant. Okay? What's the object? The elephant. What's that? The pink elephant. Okay. Everybody agrees? Your vision. What? Your vision. No, 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 no. The reference to an object. Okay, that's the danger that... I'm going to move it back because I had it centered on the camera. Okay. That's... You, you, yes? Could you define object, of course? Well, what the object of your experience, right? It's almost defining uh, from a language point of view. Right? What's that? It's almost defining from a language point of view. So, in English grammar... No, I don't... You have a vision of a pink elephant. I guess you need to imbib a certain amount of substance. Uh, and you have vision of a pink elephant. Yes? Some uh, comments have to do with uh, hallucinatory or possibly hallucinatory. I'm not talking. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, it has to do with that, but this is not the question. <laughs> So, Denise said the elephant, right? Why do you say that? Because normally when we speak about the object, we speak yeah. about something, an object of experience. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. It is a pink elephant. 
You can say pink elephant doesn't exist. No. So what? Well, this is exist, right? what? It could have been an elephant painted pink. It's, uh, well, I'm talking uh, about an hallucination. I'm not talking. Okay, okay. Like, yes. Uh, a yes. I'm talking about an hallucination because it creates an interesting problem which suggests that when Brentano is talking about an object, we have to be careful and precisely not go to an image because the object of our experience, this is the first person perspective, is the pink elephant. And you would say, the pink elephant doesn't exist. Yes, that's exactly why it's an hallucination, right? Yes. So the pink elephant, right? That's the object of, that's what the intentionality, the object of the consciousness is. Now, this intentionality is not just the idea that uh, consciousness is about something, which is often what people understand. It's more than that. It's the idea that consciousness is about making sense of the world, right? So, for example, I'm going to give a conceptual ex uh, example, and then after that I'm going to give a perceptual ex example. It's <laughs> keep me happy. Yes, it's not very like that. I, I, I do that in my class as well. I'm not as bad as you think I am. <laughs> uh, okay. A conceptual experience, the Chinese room. This is a famous piece of uh, contemporary philosophy. Suppose you are in a room and uh, people feed you Chinese ideograms and you have all the rules that you need to respond to these ideograms appropriately, and you just do it mechanically, right? Okay? <laughs> that Chinese room, people would claim, does not understand Chinese, right? It's just mechanically responding according to certain fixed rules. What needs to happen is for a person to understand what it means. And that's what intentionality is about. Understanding what it means. Under so when I'm talking about a pink elephant, it's not just having a pink elephant, but seeing the pink elephant, for example, as a pink elephant. That's making sense, right? Of the world as it is given in my experience. Right? Okay, let's take another example. Actually, more interesting, but uh, harder to understand. Walking. Right? You think, hello? What's about walking? Walking, actually, when you perceive walking, it is a way to make sense of, the, of your experience, right? Suppose you see a person walking, you are, your consciousness, your visual consciousness is making sense of the input it's receiving in terms of seeing the person walk. In certain conditions, people don't see walking. What do they see? body occupying different position. That's a defective visual consciousness, visual experience. The defect is obviously in the, way, in the brain. It's due to uh, some kind of seizure or some kind of uh, uh, condition. And so that person doesn't see walking. Right? See just body like you walking, not walking, occupying position one, two, three, four, and so on. And that consciousness is unable to make sense of what it receives, of the world that it is, that is given in its experience. 
Most people are able to make sense when I see Pandit walking towards me. Okay, he's coming, he's walking. That's a way in which, a very, very basic way in which consciousness is intentional, meaning it's making sense of what is given in my experience. Yes? So that means that consciousness is educated. Um, because you could say that consciousness turns into things like you're walking. Yes. You're actually seeing the same thing as everybody else, but you don't call that walking. Yes. So there's a light of pink elephant. Why do you see the colors? <laughs> well, the walking. It's, it's learned. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it is learned. And in particularly, it's learned in the very few weeks of the life of the baby in which the baby learns how to, for example, uh, the idea of a fixed object, right? Is now there are different views about when exactly it happens in the, in the, in the baby, but the baby learns that uh, the object that she sees here and there when the object is moved, actually the same object, right? So for example, per permanence of object is a condition of our being able to make sense of certain experience, and that's something we learn very, very early on, right? So indeed, uh, what has happened in the first few weeks and months of existence is very interesting and very important to understand consciousness, and one of the problem that I have with a lot of philosophy of mind is that it completely ignores all this developmental story and just focus on the consciousness of the person who is 40 years old and is sitting uh, in his armchair, right? No, there is a long story and you're absolutely right. It's not uh, ingrained, right? We have to learn very quick. Some things are ingrained, but something I learned very quickly <coughs> and indeed. So this is a way in which we learn to make sense of what is given in our experience, right? Was there a hand in? Yes? That, that helps me to define what I meant by um, experience as a stream of events. Yes. In this case, there are a series of disconnected events that that person experiences. Exactly. So the stream of, of events is a narrative that we're creating potentially at a subconscious level. I wouldn't, uh, yeah, it's not a question of narrative at this level. It's just it's a question. No, yeah, a yeah, I would not use the word narrative and people overuse the word narrative. Here is not a question of narrativity, right? It's a question of just learning how that there is a single object which is moving across space and so on. Exactly. What? Yeah, it's like putting together, right? Yeah. Related to that, there's this uh, model of mind, uh, like uh, the mind model, mind moments model. Yes. And I was wondering how it relates to this second model of consciousness, because the background, the foreground, are the same same moment. Or? Yes. Yes. I would say in any single moment of consciousness, uh, there is a background and a foreground, right? Yeah. That's the idea, at least that's the hypothesis that we're exploring, right? Yes, please. Um, well, does intentionality only include, only encompass processes that we're not consciously aware of? Like when we see someone walking, we interpret that as walking, but we don't think about the fact that we're interpreting that as walking, right? Well, it's conscious. It's conscious, but we don't, <laughs> like it's not an active, I guess it's not an active process of interpretation. No. Sure, but here is what I think phenomenology insists, and I think rightly so, and in that it's pretty much in agreement uh, with a lot of Indian views about the mind, which is uh, we want to move away from this Western idea that identify consciousness with thinking. We have both phenomenology and Indian philosophy of mind are of one voice of saying, no, consciousness is not limited to thinking. There is a pre-reflective level of experience 
which is, in a way, what we, we are talking about. This is why I gave you two, ex two kind of examples, because the first example of the Chinese room is an example of an explicit interpretation, right? We understand only when we're able to interpret the sign. Okay, that's an example of intentionality, but it would be a real problem to understand consciousness, and this is what a lot of people do. Uh, if we identified consciousness with thinking, and in Indian philosophy there is the uh, idea that what is primary is not f thinking or is not uh, anumana inference, but is pratyaksha perception. And I think similar to that, I think uh, a, a lot of phenomenology want to insist that uh, our experience starts at the pre-reflective level, right? And understanding somebody as walking is a way pre-reflective because we don't make any kind of explicit interpretation, but we are perfectly conscious of that, right? Yeah? So the infant, who hasn't really learned much yet, lacks intentionality. Well, no, there is always a certain level of intentionality, but uh, it's obviously developing, right? Well, so I don't know what the... The infant is always able to make sense to a very limited... We are always too able to make sense to a very limited extent of our experience, right? So even the infant will act subject permanence. Yeah. Doesn't mean that he lacks any cognitive ability. Right. Yeah. So the infant that hasn't learned much yet, that's learning to learn, he has consciousness without intentionality. No, he has intentionality, but much more limited. What he is able to make sense of is much more limited than uh, uh, an older child, right? But their, their pure experience is probably much more vibrant. Yes. 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 I mean, they say that even babies in the womb learn when they hear music. It's like a, a very fundamental level. Yes. But though this is... Right from the earliest time. Yes. Up information. Yes. Though this is pretty controversial, how much is really happening in the womb and not. But yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So is consciousness necessary for intentionality? Intentionality is maybe... a necessary, it's a putative candidate for invariance of experience. Okay? Now, yeah? There can also be intentionality without consciousness. For example, like blind sight uh, patients, they can still make sense of what they're seeing without being conscious of it. Well, uh, we talked about blind sight uh, and it's not sure what's going on with blind sight. Remember, blind sight is this condition in which people uh, claim to be blind, and I, in a certain way are blind, but are able to navigate in the world and are able to make guesses about large objects, right? And another example of that was a guy I met who couldn't move his left arm deliberately, consciously. Yes. But if a fly landed on his face, he could swap the fly. Okay, yes. But if you say, touch the cup, he said, no, I can't move on. Yes, exactly. So, how to interpret blind sight is a little tricky. Some people say it's a problem with attention, and it's actually in consciousness, but the person is unable to post, to attend to. So, this is controversial. What? Hemineglect? Yes, similar. The hemi neglect is even weirder because the person actually sees that left side, right? Which he claims not being able to see. He just wants to cram everything on the right side, right? Okay, so this is the most important feature of consciousness from Husserl's perspective. Intentionality. As you can see, these are very general features. Uh, they are not the kind of thing that you expect uh, uh, as invariant feature, but 
this is precisely what we want, something which is so general that it can be uh, kind of read across many, many different experiences. Uh, it's, for example, it's not without interest for me to think whether in, from a Buddhist perspective, whether in objectless meditation there is intentionality or not, right? There is no object, there is no making sense, at least in the experience itself, so I have real qualms. Uh, this is why I always like this putative. But as you can see, this is a really pretty uh, special experience. Most other experiences uh, seem to have this feature of intentionality. Yes? Sorry, can I just ask, uh, in the objectless meditation, isn't there some uh, sense in which the objectless meditation is the object? I mean, in other words, you, yeah. have, you decide how to do objectless meditation and you have some sort of sense that that's what you're doing. Is that true? I would say probably not, but uh, this is debated inside the Buddhist tradition as well. Uh, my sense is no. I would say uh, the, the description of objectless meditation comes from the borderline state. When you just get out of the state and you just think back, where you were. But this is kind of de very debatable. So I'm just putting he this as a kind of interesting question, which I'm not sure myself. Yes? Just a quick quote from the book. Yes. Um, that consciousness is always conscious of something. It's yeah. referred to as the intentionality of consciousness. Yeah. But that's why I wanted to emphasize this meaning-making rather than this idea of having an object because often people understand intentionality as just there is the object and here I go. No, that's not uh, a, a good way to understand intentionality. Intentionality is the ability to make sense of what is given in experience. Yes? I guess I'm not totally clear on the word object because it seems to me you could explain an objectless meditation by reference to the practice leading to wisdom or, you know, there would be an aim to that. Oh yeah, but that's different. You couldn't call the aim an object? No. Object Always what is given in experience. It doesn't need to be a thing. As far as I know, a pink elephant is not a thing. But the aim for <laughs> wisdom, or the aim, you know... Is not the object, in the sense... That's the objective. It's the object. I mean, you can say... No, no, you, look, you can use the word object in the sense that the goal, the objective, and so on. But it's not what the word object here mean is the object is what is present in my own experience. It's a thing. The pink what? elephant, as far as I know, are not a thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving on. <laughs> moving. Okay, so intentionality <coughs> is the number one feature for Husserl, especially in his first stage what I have talked, static phenomenology. Now I'm going to talk about a couple of other uh, putative candidates for invariance. One is, uh, I could call it uh, different, is perspectivalism or holism. Uh, 